I pride myself on my ability to discern game quality at a glance. After watching a trailer or seeing some gameplay footage, it's a skill we should all try to develop as it saves a decent amount of money long term by not buying into stuff that turns out to be either garbage or just not our style. But sometimes you can be wrong anyway. Either a game you think you'll like turns out to be trash, or a game you didn't think you'd be into turns out to be one of your favorites. So I got to thinking about the times I've been wrong about impending releases I'd written off one way or the other, either by dismissing them or by believing the hype a little too hard, as well as games I'd initially tried, didn't like, but then came back later and things finally clicked. So here's ten of those in no order throughout my history as an avid gamer. Number one, Borderlands. The original Borderlands on PS3. I was in middle or high school when I first tried Borderlands with my dad as player two. It was also my first introduction to RPG mechanics outside of Kingdom Hearts, so seeing it in a shooter just didn't click. Like, I didn't understand why it was taking ten headshots to kill people a higher level than me when the FPS games I grew up on were like Call of Duty and Medal of Honor. On top of that, my first impression of the art style was that it was ugly and bad, and I could probably be forgiven for that since the game leans into being gross and off-putting, but I'd never heard of cell shading as a style choice, so I literally thought that was just the best they could do. I was like, damn, these people suck at graphics. Actually, now that I think about it, Borderlands did used to have a more realistic coat of paint. There's even a Game Informer cover issue from before it came out that showed it looking way more traditional before they pivoted late in development. So I think I had that in my head going in, and I was like, what the hell happened? Who let their kindergarten class take over the design department? So it was a game we rented, because it was 2008 or something and Blockbuster was still a thing, and we returned it after playing for an hour. We talked to the guy at the counter about what we thought, and he mansplained what cell shading is and how to play an open world RPG with loot in it, and that it's actually important to keep changing your gun as you level up so its damage keeps up. Really toddlerific stuff, but we needed to hear it. So we rented it again, took it back home, booted it up, played correctly, got sucked into it like mad, returned it on the due date, then promptly went and bought it and eventually finished the game. It reminds me that sometimes, no matter how good a game is, if the player doesn't fundamentally understand the concept, they're just not going to see any of the quality behind it. Call it gaming literacy. People who study it are going to have a much easier time clicking with things and figuring out why they do or don't like something. Number two, Mortal Kombat 11. I played the hell out of Mortal Kombat X, which was my first Mortal Kombat game, and I loved the characters, combos, and juggling in it. But one thing I didn't realize was so central to my enjoyment until Mortal Kombat 11 launched without it was the running mechanic. In MKX, you can extend some juggle combos that launch opponents up and a little horizontally by chasing them down with the run mechanic to quickly close the distance and get a few more hits in. It's also just good for getting close to opponents trying to zone you out with projectiles to rush them down. Doing that for almost 100 hours in X just made 11 feel like everyone's legs had brittle bone disease. All you could do in 11 was a little quick step forward or backward that had lag at the end of it so you couldn't really chain them together without getting spanked by whoever you were slowly creeping up on. It's super stiff and clumsy in contrast to the smooth fluidity that running provided, and it was an immediate disappointment and I completely lost interest in the game. Shame. Number three, Skyrim. I was that gaming hipster in high school that didn't want to play what everybody was playing, even though I also bought Call of Duty every year, so I can't really reconcile it. Skyrim was the talk of the town for months leading up to its release. I couldn't escape it. I didn't even really know what it was since I never played an Elder Scrolls game before, but I knew that I resented the game for being popular. So when it launched, I was like, I don't care. I'm not playing it. Whatever. Part of me was also jealous because I was a Batman Arkham City stan, which came out a month earlier and ended up getting higher overall review scores, so I kept wanting to be like, Skyrim isn't Game of the Year, Arkham City is! And then they gave Skyrim Game of the Year anyway, because it's obviously a more massive and iconic experience, even though Arkham City is more polished and I would even say more fun, just for a shorter amount of time. So that fueled my resentment, and it wouldn't be until next year that boredom and a 50% off sale got me to finally try the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim. And guess what? I hated it. Why? Very similarly to Borderlands, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I didn't know what things made me level up. It didn't occur to me that I should be leveling up offensive skills instead of just environmental ones like lockpicking and sneak. When it came to the Bleak Falls Barrow quest, I didn't find the road that leads up the mountain, so I spent an hour trying to just hop up the side of it. And at one point, I was wandering across the whole map just discovering locations but not entering any of them, so the autosave never triggered, and after three hours of doing that, I got killed by a tiger and realized all that shit was lost. I returned the game shortly thereafter, vindicated in my dislike of it. Then, I don't know why, I think I watched a video on it or something, but a few months later I bought it again, looked up some tips and tricks, and everything just fell into place, and I now have probably 800 hours across multiple consoles. I don't know, man, sometimes you just need to double dip 
Take a few months between dips, see if you gained any knowledge from other sources that could apply to what you were missing out of the initial dip, and maybe after that you'll change your mind completely. Number four, Dark Souls 2. Basically identical to Skyrim minus the popularity part. I had zero inkling of what Souls games even were when I first tried this. My first ever Souls game, and I had the classic first-timer experience of, oops, you died while you were carrying a lot of souls, and then you died again before you could pick them back up. And now you want to put this game in a meat grinder and serve it between two slices of bread to a homeless man. But like with Skyrim, I returned to it after some time had passed and learned how Souls games work, and it became one of my favorite games. To this day, it's a top two Souls game for me. I'm just super familiar with it, and playing it is like coming home after years of traveling abroad. Number five, Back for Blood. As someone who only played Left for Dead like once at a friend's house, I don't know why I was hyped for this game in the first place, but four-player zombie co-op sounded like a great time with friends after having done it so often in early iterations of Nazi zombies. Obviously a different experience, but still. And then Back for Blood came out and it was just kind of meh. It was okay. You couldn't even do the campaign missions offline initially, so when the friends weren't around, there was nothing to do if you didn't want to join up on randos, which I almost never want to do in any game. It's like going to the park as a toddler and your mom's like, go play with the other kids, but you just hide behind her leg and look up at her like, what if they call me the N-word? But in my case, I'm more worried about people who are just annoying. I don't know what Back for Blood could have done differently content-wise, I just know it wasn't that fun, I played it for two days. Number six, Spelunky 2. I'ma lose some people here, but as a mild enjoyer of the original Spelunky, I had high hopes for the sequel after seeing the trailers because it all looked very sequel-y in a good way with more variety and whatnot. Uh, but every run I did of Spelunky 2 felt exactly like the last one. The first game had technically less variability, but it felt like you saw the different stuff a lot more. Spelunky 2 just felt like replaying the same game over and over, especially the first area. The first area for me was borderline identical every single time. Sometimes they do the prompt where it's like, oh, things are different now, like the snakes. I hate snakes from the original, but then I wouldn't notice a single difference. So I fell off it. Maybe I'll try it again, though. Number seven, Death Stranding. I had an open mind on this one going in. I was attracted by the story beats shown in the trailers, and I had already preemptively internalized that the game would be boring from a gameplay perspective. That's how much I was willing to overlook in service to the narrative. I was willing to be bored for long stretches of time, walking across mountains to deliver packages like a dedicated FedEx employee. What I didn't realize was Kojima's apparent penchant for breaking the fourth wall in pointlessly stupid ways. I didn't make it past the third chapter. Honestly, I could barely make it past the damn hub room, where Sam Porter Bridges showers and takes pisses on command while posters of his mocap actor's other projects hang on the fucking walls. There's a goddamn promo for Ride with Norman Reedus on AMC just in the game. I'm surprised it's not next to the weekly schedule for The Walking Dead. The monster energy marketing is gratuitous, but the part I hate the most is Sam knowing he's in a game in an otherwise serious story, because when you change camera angles, he physically grabs the camera and points at the shit you're gonna look at. Like, hey, check this out, player one. It's just an all-around immersion breaker and feels like a cheapening of the story for no reason, which made it no longer worth enduring horrendous gameplay for her. Number eight, Spiritfarer. I wrote this one off publicly, actually, in my 2021 Roast of the Game Awards nominees. I knew almost nothing about the game, but I looked at the art style of the thumbnail and the category it was in, Games for Impact, and just figured it was some social justice, whatever. But even though that's kind of not incorrect based on a decent amount of the subject matter, it's a really good game besides. Being nominated for Games for Impact usually just means there's gay characters in the game that may or may not talk about what it's like to be gay, and then you can just replace gay with whatever minority the game wants to showcase. So the impact generally begins and ends with a cast list. I'm about 12 hours into Spiritfarer, where so far you're the only human form in a boat full of animal forms, so they haven't done race, but they have done some LGBT stuff. Plus your character presents as a dude who looks like Peter Pan, but everyone calls them Stella and refers to them as she, so I don't know what that's about, but I'll take your word for it. I've also seen a totally cool takedown of capitalism in the form of a union protest, which had almost breathtakingly stupid dialogue. It's always fun to see a political issue being explored through the lens of someone who is very clearly an ardent supporter of one side, and then their method of exploring it is just to make their side say all the applaudable things while the other side is cartoonishly evil and gets all their talking points oversimplified and misrepresented. It's like when a comedian tells a story about a conversation that definitely happened, where he's said all the right things in the moment and totally owned the other person. It's a feel-good straw man takedown. I hate it in comedy and I hate it in politics. 
I have no opinion on unions IRL because I am not informed on that particular topic, but heavy bias is easy to recognize, and I just find that kind of overt imaginary propaganda to be irritating. But the game itself is so engrossing. Sailing around, managing resources, keeping your passengers happy, and eventually saying goodbye to them as you see them off to the next life. I've never played Spirit Fair for less than four hours at a time. You just get in this rhythm of things to do, and it's gripping as hell. Fishing, growing crops, building houses for your passengers, and upgrading different stations as well as the boat itself. So I was wrong about Spirit Fair because it isn't a lame progressive game. It's a super good progressive game. Number nine, Hitman. I don't know why I was actually blind to how awesome this franchise is. I literally watched people play maps in Hitman 2, and somehow it didn't look like my kind of game. Then about a month out from Hitman 3, I took the plunge in a sale and bought both Hitman 1 and 2, and I was immediately proven wrong. I was having fun frame one from the get-go. It clicked like it was born to click. I must have replayed every map like 10 times at least, going for challenges and just approaching from different angles, memorizing layouts. Oh man, when you master a map, you feel like God. You know which which NPCs are where, all the weapon locations, how to manipulate people to do what you want. The replayability is off the charts. Hitman 3 came out as more of the same, which is good, but I like the first two games' maps better. And the camera gadget is a pointless addition you have to scroll past in your inventory that just opens some locked doors that could have just as easily been locked some other way that didn't involve needing a pointless camera you only put in there to say you put something in there. Still a tremendous franchise, though. Number 10, Rock Band 4. Rock Band 4 is the biggest disappointment I've ever played. What was supposed to be a triumphant revival of the rhythm genre turned into a wimp-tastic disaster as the devs either didn't believe in themselves, had no budget, or both. Rock Band 3 was a phenomenal game. Everything about it was engaging. The added keys instrument was a banger. The solo tour system was boss. It was just a complete package and then some. Conversely, Rock Band 4 took out the keys instrument, didn't launch with a fucking practice mode somehow, and online play wasn't implemented until like a year later at the non sensical cost of 30 extra dollars, half the price of the initial game just to play online, something Rock Band 2 and 3 did for free. The entire enterprise was dog shit, the fourth game in the franchise, and they still didn't put built-in silencer pads into the drum controllers, which is a no-brainer. You can barely hear the song in-game over the incessant tapping of your own drumsticks unless you used the silencers you previously had to buy separately for Rock Band 3. They also didn't sell instruments separately from the game. They had a guitar game bundle and a band game bundle, but the band game bundle only came with one guitar. So if you wanted two of them for somebody to play bass alongside you, you had to buy an extra copy of the goddamn game or look on Amazon for some scalper trash selling a day one guitar purchase at double the price. Oh, did I mention the new guitars had hardware issues that made them randomly disconnect during songs? Rock Band 4 was a horrendous, expensive, incomplete, malfunctioning abomination that killed the genre for good. Inexcusable. Well, that's gonna do it for this video. Like, share, and subscribe. Comment below what games you've been wrong about in your time. Follow me on Twitter at SunburnedAlbino. Watch all my videos with short shorts on that say juicy on the back, and I'll see you guys next time.